Hey guys, Johnny Quirk back once again here to support your entrepreneurial journey. Okay, cool. So today I'm delighted to say that we have Mike Sten Harris from Inside Property Investing. How are you doing today, Mike? Yeah, I'm great, Johnny. Thank you for having me. Delighted to be here. Yeah, and I'm delighted that you can actually be on the show because it's been a while I've been trying to get you here. And that's because not only are you an entrepreneur, uh, but you're also a successful side hustler and a digital nomad in uh, you know non-COVID time. So we're going to cover all those things later on, but it does sound like you're living the dream and taking control of your own destiny. But um, first off, maybe in your own words, maybe you could describe your business and exactly what it is that you do. Uh, sure, yeah. So we, I guess there are three verticals if you like to, to what we do it's all within the the property or the real estate industry uh, we've been involved in this part-time for probably over a decade now but full-time for about six years um first and foremost i'd say we are developers so we we buy property we renovate it or build um and then we'll either rent out or sell it on fairly sort of typical uh, property investment business um we do that in and around the northwest of england uh, the second aspect of it is, I guess, the media side of things. So on the back of renovating houses and sort of starting to tell our story via social media, for some reason, I decided to turn on a microphone about six years ago and we launched yeah. our own podcast. And then the opportunities that have come from the back of that, just things that we never expected, but we've moved into, um, you know, we've got a, a good following now and that's led into education, digital products and that sort of stuff. Um, and then the third one, which is the kind of the least sexy bit, but it kind of sits behind everything, I guess, is more of the the property management, making sure that, you know, everything that we build up runs in the background. So we kind of look at them as three distinct businesses, but they're all related and interlinked. Of course. And, uh, you know, I, I guess the business model, that means that you've got numerous kind of different um, you know, sources of revenue coming in each month. Yeah, exactly. And it's something that we... Um, we definitely strive for it would be nice to have a little bit more diversification beyond just the the property industry but it's nice to know that even within a single industry we've got multiple different income streams so if one of them struggles at uh, any point in time i mean obviously coming out the back of uh covid well i say that that's optimistic hopefully coming out the back <laughs> of covid um you know we have a couple of properties that we rent out on airbnb that was slow last year but to know yeah. that we had other things to to keep that income topped up was nice yeah, brilliant. And it seems like that's kind of like happened in a fairly organic way, you know, in terms of, you know, you were into property, like you said, the podcast and the kind of education piece has come at a later date. Um, what, what kind of gave you the initial idea? Have you always been into property or did you just see a gap in the market? Uh, no, it was something that I had been interested in growing up. Um, my, my dad kind of dabbled in it a little bit, renovated a few uh, sort of single uh, houses when I was growing up. And uh you know, typical daytime or evening TV I was watching like Sarah Beanie and um, Kevin McLeod on pro, uh, Grand Designs and that sort of stuff. And I just, I had a real interest in it. Um, before I went off to uni, I ended up buying like a cheapest chips flat in my hometown. It was yeah. like bargain basement stuff. And it gave me like a bit of beer money every month whilst I was at uni. Um, and it, it just sort of escalated from there. So th there's always been an interest, um, but I suppose it was more, I knew I always wanted to run my own business rather than necessarily always wanting to be involved in property. Yeah. And are you, um, you know, do, do you naturally come from an entrepreneurial family? I mean, obviously you did mention, you know, your parents before I think your dad, you know, like, is it is it was it in the blood is this kind of like always been something you thought you would do one day yeah it's it, it definitely was and it, it's funny now thinking about um you know if, if we have a family how, how i'm going to try and uh tackle this with them but my, <laughs> my parents had always run their own businesses they had a couple of bars and restaurants and then they went into a couple of different things from there but growing up i always you know they were always running their own businesses and they always said, you know, we're doing this so that you don't have to. We're sacrificing and working all these hours and, um, you know, just not having a nine to five, not having consistent income. And they're like, we're doing all of this so that you can go to university and then you can get a good job as a lawyer or a doctor or something else. And I was like, yeah. nah, I want to work all the hours and have inconsistent <laughs> income. And so it's, it's kind of it's ironic that, you know, everything that they were doing to try and direct us down a different path uh, yeah. led me to think, no, that's actually what I want to do. So, yeah, it, it's always been at the back of my mind that I wanted to do something for myself. And we've had a number of guests on this show already. And I think it's quite interesting because a lot of people are, you know, nobody's really come and said, you know, there was, you know nobody's like Elon Musk's son or something like that and goes, oh, wow, you know, I was born into it from day one with education. But I think everybody's either 
been encouraged at some stage of their life or have literally taken a normal job and just gone, oh God, if this is life for the next 50 years, then, uh, then you know, I need an, uh, a way out of that really. So it seems like you've almost kind of just gone, right, okay, like you said, you don't mind working the hours and putting the hours in if you're in control of your own destiny. Yeah, exactly. And it's it's doing something that I enjoy. It's having that flexibility. I mean, you mentioned the sort of digital nomad side of things. Um, we love traveling. Um, but, you know, for us, business was never so that we, we didn't need to work. You know, I don't want yeah. to retire. I enjoy what I do. It's just nice to have that flexibility to work from where we want to, to work where we want to um, and when we want. So it's, yeah, it, it's, it's really about flexibility, but not so much like you know, I don't want to work. I enjoy what I do, um, yeah. but just have the options to work, you know, on our own terms, I guess. Of course. Yeah. Brilliant. And I think, you know, let's just kind of break down what you do, because I think, you know, I'm trying to do this in a chronological way. I think you said you started out, you know, renovating properties and flipping them. How did you get started in that? I mean, like, well, what does it come from doing, like buying your first house? Like, is it you doing all the work or do you outsource that to people? You know, like, how, yeah. how fast can you go in terms of learning? You know, I'm interested to know how you got into that. Oh, I mean, I we we definitely went about it the wrong, you know, with, with hindsight, we can obviously say, oh yeah, well, we do it this way now. But at the time we started off like a lot of people did, um, but we, uh, I'm talking about myself and my wife. So we met yeah. in the corporate world. We we both got onto a grad scheme for Procter & Gamble. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was a great job, you know, decent income. It was relatively easy from a, an hour, you know, it wasn't like a sort of 12, 14 hour day grad job that you hear about. It was, it was a good place to work and we were, we were doing well, but, um, we, we basically started renovating our own homes. So, um, we, we needed somewhere to live. Uh, we, again, you know, started at the bottom end of the property ladder and it was literally stripping wallpaper and painting and trying to do as much of it ourselves as we could at the time we thought we were saving money. Um, but, you know, it, at those stages when we were doing that, we'd buy a house, renovate it, we'd sell it, we'd make, you know, 10 or 15 grand and we'd blast it all on a holiday or something. There was no sense of this is going to be a business. It was just a side income, something we enjoyed doing. Yeah. Um, and it was very much alongside fitting it in evenings and weekends when we could. Um, and then it wasn't until maybe a couple of years after that that we realized actually there could be a business from it. Um, and... Victoria decided to, to stay in the corporate job whilst I left and tried to build up the, the income side of things, which was great to have that sort of dual income that she could yeah. continue to support us whilst I had that runway to, to go out and figure out how we could replace the income. Um, and then I guess it took us a couple of years to, to start holding onto properties rather than selling them, build up that, that rental income to the stage that she was then able to leave. Um, and you know, it was a drop in income. It was, it was a, a sacrifice that we made, but, um, yeah, it, it was very much hands on both of us just trying to fit in the hours when we could and, and, yeah. you know, trying to do everything ourselves. But, um, it, you know, that's obviously led to, to where we are now. It's interesting what you're saying as well about how, yeah, first off, it was more just the like, wow, we could get 15, 20 grand. We could go on this dream holiday. <laughs> so, you know, there was nothing more like, let's you know build a property empire. Let's just yeah. figure this out. It's another stream of income, really. You know, we all subscribe to that Warren Buffett way of thinking of, you know, there's got to be many different sources of income if we're all not going to be living a retirement where we're, you know, like working as the part time, pushing trolleys <laughs> or welcoming people or whatever like that, which yep. I'm afraid is probably the way it's going. Um, but as you've grown this kind of property rental, like say, I call empire, how many properties do you currently have? And, and do you actually get tempted to keep a load for rental? Or do you think, oh, actually, we could probably do all right selling a few of them off? I'm interested to know what that kind of business mix is there. So we definitely try to keep as much of them as we can. We're, we're doing this for, for the long term as much as anything. And it's nice to sell a project and get that cash in the bank, but it's very lumpy. It's difficult to, to live off and plan for that sort of, you know, 18 month project where you get paid at the end and then you're thinking, well, it's 18 months until I do another development. And so, I mean, development in as much as, uh, you know, new builders who are going out there buying land, building properties and selling it. Yeah. It can be really lucrative, but it is, it's a bit of a roller coaster. So our, our view was always to, to hold on to what we could build the income and you, you kind of get multiple different benefits from that. So um, you get the monthly income from it, which is great. Mm -hmm. But then obviously long term, there's capital appreciation. So um, we're kind of getting wealthier on paper every day that we hold on to them on average. Yeah. You know, obviously the market goes up and down, but um, you know, over 10, 15 years, we're probably going to be going up in value generally. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's nice. Occasionally, we'll sell things if the the project lends itself to that. In particular, we're doing a. Uh, a, a sort of residential flip just now, which is the first one we've done in a couple of years. And we bought that knowing we were going to sell it just because the numbers made more sense from that point of view. Yeah. Um, and obviously it's quite an expensive game as well. So, um, you know, development projects can run into hundreds of thousands of pounds. We need to replace our cash. So occasionally we'll do a project that we sell because then we can reinvest the profits into um, another portfolio. Now you asked me a question. I'm not going to avoid it, but I'm going to talk around the subject of how many properties we own. Um, I think it's it's something that it's probably the first question that we get asked by people who are looking to get into property. You know, what size yeah. is your portfolio? Um, and the reason we're kind of reluctant to share it is there are people out there who will. You know, I think it all comes down to the effectiveness of how you run your business. There are people out there who will have, you know, three or four really profitable like you know maybe like a uh, like a light industrial unit that they've got a, a good tenant in there um yep. you know like a, a quick fit or a screw fix or something and they will make far more than we will with our portfolio and with the number we have got we'll be making more than somebody who's got 200 that they've bought badly like it's yeah. it's kind of a a bit of an arbitrary measure so um i kind of i i, I think people should focus more on the the income of each individual deal rather than you know the size of the portfolio it's a bit of a vanity metric if you like okay so it sounds like mike has about a thousand properties so yeah <laughs> i'm on hold here that he's squirreled away over the years you know without telling everybody but no that's cool man that, that makes perfect sense in terms of that um but i i imagine as well in terms of this in, in terms of this business you know do you ever I mean, are you trying to grow this as a sustainable business where you go, right, like you said, you know, you're not having to have sleepless nights where you go, oh, have we leveraged ourselves too much? Or do you ever just get excited and go, oh, if we just borrowed, I don't know, a million, say, uh, you know, like, you know, keep mortgage on your properties where we could build five or six more and then all of a sudden you're like, we have an extra five million worth of property and, you know, like that or, you know. I'm yeah, no, for like, sure. You know. It's... um. It, it, to be honest, it's the kind of nice thing about having uh, the two of us, my wife and I, working on it. She's far more conservative and uh, sensible um, yeah. in, in a good way. She makes good decisions whilst I'm trying to, you know, ruin it, bet it all on red <laughs> and sort of uh, yeah. see where we end up. But we, we've got a, a mutual agreement that we would never do a project that could break us. So from a risk point of view, um, yes, you know, we... Again, you know, from a property point of view, there's a lot of leverage. There's a lot of debt there to buy properties to mm -hmm. renovate them. Um, but we've agreed that we would never take on a single project that if it didn't go to plan, it would ruin us. So we'll take yeah. on risk. Um, but, you know, it, it's taken us a decade to get to this stage. The last yeah. thing we want to do is, uh, for the sake of a single deal, risk everything. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of trying to keep that balance right. I want growth. I want to build the business bigger than it is. Um, but yeah, not not at the expense of, of potentially losing everything that we've worked for. Of course. And I guess, you know, like 10 years is great. You know, I was going to ask you, like, you know, when it kind of really started this kind of journey, this entrepreneurial journey of yourself. Um, six years ago, I know you started your podcast and mm -hmm. started to build like a, a mini audience, mini community around this. I guess that was just a natural a natural move after being in property and enjoying it. You want to share your knowledge with the world. Yeah, I mean, the I, I say we've been doing this for a decade. So the first house I bought was uh, when I was 18. And then we didn't do anything else for like four years. Mm. And then we bought another one and then we didn't do anything for two years. So actually like six years is how long we've been building the, the property business fairly aggressively. It took yeah. us a while to get started. Um, but that was around about the time that I think I'd maybe been out of the corporate world for about a year or so at that point. So maybe seven years or something like that. Um, the podcast kind of came about as uh, I'd, I'd been driving back and forwards between Newcastle where we were living in Manchester where we were looking to relocate to and was listening to podcasts on the drive to and from it's the first time I'd really discovered it because I all of a sudden had like a two-hour drive every Monday morning and every Friday night yeah. and I came across a guy called John Lee Dumas I don't know if you've come across him no, um, no I don't. But he was effectively uh, hosting a podcast American based where he was interviewing entrepreneurs and it just sort of filled me with this uh this sort of passion and um it equally got me thinking that hey this is the type of format that i could replicate and apply it to our industry interviewing yeah. other property investors and it would be good for me because i can learn from them but equally at the time i was thinking 
reading through some of Seth Godin's stuff about building an audience, I was like, it, it must be a good idea to have a community, to have a following. I didn't know what for. I didn't know how we were going to monetize it or, you know, for what reason we were building it. It just felt like the right thing to do to start building a brand. Yeah. So um, podcast felt like a, a sort of natural offshoot from that. And yeah, it just reached out to a couple of people in our community, uh, hosted fairly informal interviews with them, and it, it just all started to scale from there. Oh, that's great because we are going to dig a little bit later in for some of your tips on how to you know, build a community from scratch, build an audience, those sorts of things from your own experiences. But then I guess once you've built this community now, this audience, you know, I think you're up to almost 350 episodes, which is crazy. You know, that's good. You know, we've got a long way to go here on the Go Solo show to catch up with Mike, guys. So uh, maybe I need to start doing three or four recordings a week. Um, but, you know, I guess this now moves on to the all, you know, tertiary product, I guess, which you're actually putting out there, which you said is more the education piece, the courses, those sorts of stuff. How's that going? Yeah, it's, it's going really well. One thing that we are passionate about doing i guess is trying to keep the two in balance so mm -hmm. we don't want to become educators first and foremost we like to i think from a credibility point of view it helps the fact that we are like actively in the trenches working on property deals at the yeah. same time as we're teaching it so we always try to keep the the income from them equal we always try to keep the growth of them sort of in sync wherever possible uh, but the education piece has been Phenomenal. I mean, I mentioned this with the podcast. We learn a heck of a lot from the stuff that we are creating, right? They say that the best way to learn something is to teach it. So that helps us massively from our own business point of view. Um, and if I'm trying to coach somebody through getting systems and processes in place in their business, it makes me reassess what we're doing. Um, but it, it's just been nice to introduce this additional income stream. It happened fairly organically. We were creating this content, the podcast has always been free. We started to develop a bit of an audience on Facebook and Instagram. Mm. And then people would start asking us questions and we started to notice patterns and, you know, the same questions coming up time and time again. And, you know, it started off with like a $50 uh, online course. That same course we're now selling for, you know, about 800 to 1,000 pounds. So like it's, it, it's scaled up as our yeah. expertise has progressed, as the audience is built. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just nice to have that, that sort of double income stream and to find a way to help the people who want help, but equally benefit us. It got to the stage where, you know, we would have been having coffees with people all day, every day, you know, from people who get <laughs> yeah, in touch yeah. saying, oh, I'd love to take you for a coffee and give some advice on this. I didn't drink coffee at the time, so that was a total waste of my time. But you could get yeah. so busy just offering free advice to people that we thought, no, let's monetize it we can help people who genuinely want the support and if they don't want to take advantage of that there's still the free stuff there behind them as well yeah and i guess that's that's, that's really cool because you know it's almost like this has become something of a phenomenon so i know we're in the uk and in the us as well you know we're, we're big into our property it's almost like that kind of you know a uh you know it's our castle really you know like in terms exactly of, you know, yeah. a good house you do that so we're all into that but i think you know, you've built the social following, you've got the podcast, you've got the courses, you've even started to get very active on Clubhouse as well, I've noticed recently in terms yep. of building that audience out. You know, how did you manage to make property investing sexy? Uh, and, you know, who, who are your kind of customers who are coming through? Are, are they other ones who are wanting to start buying and flipping houses? You know, like, who, who's your demographic? Like, who are these people paying almost $1,000 for a course? So, I mean, I think... Uh, it, it, it is a national obsession in the UK for sure. Like, you know, I think um, a lot of people look at bricks and mortar as a fairly safe investment. Um, but, I, you know, it, it's a, a good way out of the corporate world for, you know, anyone who is looking to create that, that freedom for themselves. Property, I think, is a, a fairly... Um, sustainable it's not overnight success it's not a get rich quick scheme it's slow and steady but you know you can you can make phenomenal wealth from it i think you know you read the the sunday times rich list obviously it comes out every year in the uk document and the sort of wealthiest people and um whether they have made their money from property or they've just invested it in that it has become a great uh you know it's one of the most popular sort of income streams in that list of sort of the, the wealthiest UK residents. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's a great way out of the, the rat race, I guess, for anyone who wants to start a business, but maybe doesn't have a specific passion or, or skill set and, a, you know, something else. 
Well, yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, it's just supply and demand as well, you know, in terms of that. And especially in some, you know, big cities like, say, London, you know, where property prices have just boomed over the years. It's a slight bit of a bubble right now, but I guess, you know, where you're going, um, you know, they, you know, that, that there's, you know, property is always going to be rising, really. It's been phenomenal, really, the last, say, 20 years or something like that. Yeah, and it's, it's one of these things where there's definitely, um, you know, it, it can be a dirty word. I think there is... There are definitely issues in the housing market in the UK, and we are very conscious of that. And the idea of, you know, a few people buying up a load of properties and then people are stuck renting low quality accommodation. Like there, there are some major issues with the market in the UK. Um, but, you know, I like to think that we can actually improve that. So a lot of what we are doing, I mean, the, 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 the accommodation that we provide is a very high standard. That's first and foremost what we are, are looking to create. But we're not just going out there buying up houses that owner occupiers would be looking for. We're typically buying you know commercial buildings and converting them into residential. So we're trying to create housing rather than just divert it from one person yeah. owning it to a landlord owning it, if you like. And I keep reading this is going to be a massive trend over the next you know few years or whatever in terms of you know, re- you know, real estate, um, I guess I should probably say retail is obviously going to be on its knees a lot. And this, you know, a lot more movement into, you know, commercial transformation as well into, into, in, into residential as well. Um, without giving the game away to your competitors, uh, Mike, uh, you know, it seems like you've got those three strands. What kind of comes next? Or do you think you're kind of quite happy in terms of those, those, those three focuses you've got in terms of business at the moment? Yeah, I mean, there, there's a couple of things. So I think the, the education space has a lot of growth potential. There are different yeah. routes that we can go down. There are different um, subject matters that we can cover within that. And there, there's, there's a huge untapped potential there for us to, to delve into, which is something that we're excited about. Um, the property market, there continues to be a housing shortage in the UK. And I think there will be for the foreseeable future. So mm. I think we will like development continued growth of their portfolio is, is definitely on our cards um but for me as like a passion project and this is where i get kind of excited because you know the 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 properties once we've acquired them and we're renting them out the income is they're kind of forever if you like so yeah that's a good place to be and it allows us to get to the stage where we can then start focusing on things that maybe wouldn't necessarily drive an immediate profit or uh, be a, a route out of a corporate gig because of the time it would take to build up. But for me, and I know you as a big foodie as well, you might like this, but you know, I would love to open like a, a barbecue restaurant or uh, sort of low and slow cooking and just be there at like 4 a.m. on the grills getting the... Wow, I, I'll be the, your number one customer, probably well, number yeah, two I mean, and three customer as well. <laughs> it's just, it would it'd just be nice to be able to do something like that, that, um, you know, property has given us that, that financial freedom. So then to be able to put our time to something that we're passionate about would, would, uh, would be great. So yeah, there's, there's a couple of different ideas that we would love to get to at some point in time. Um, and it's, yeah. it's nice to have an income stream that can kind of take over in the background and allow us to, to pursue some of those, uh, slightly, uh, more adventurous passions, I guess. Yeah, as I'm thinking, probably Victoria's looking at you now, going like, "No, Mike, that's not conservative enough. Like, let's let let's double down on what we're good at before I open up that kind of a uh, you know, ribs and slaw joint or something that you want to." That's exactly do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this kind of leads me on quite nicely um, into this next point, which is your life is digital nomad. So you know, I know obviously you and Victoria are on the on the high seas. Um, for everybody out there who doesn't know, Mike's got a, a great boat. You know, sales around, I think Spain and other places, obviously you can tell us more about in a minute. But what, 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 okay, so I think the first question I want to ask is like, what was the ultimate driver beyond obviously sun and getting away from all to actually start doing that and being able to live life as a digital nomad? You know, how would people go about that if they wanted to become a digital nomad themselves? And how are you able to run your many uh, business ventures you know, from afar when you're not actually in the country which you're doing business in? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely a test. Um, and it was something that we didn't know if it would be feasible or not, but we we decided that we would give it a try. What was the worst that could happen? Worst thing was we'd have to move back to the UK. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, was, it was kind of one of these things that we had always wanted to do. We always wanted to travel. Uh, we've got two little dogs, so them coming with us was important. And that kind of restricted some places that we could go. Um, but the idea of buying a boat, I guess, kind of meant that we could, we could move around and we could explore lots of different places and, 
uh, you know, just have a bit of fun with traveling and almost make it our home. So we did sell our own house and we bought the boat and, uh, you know, it was, it was very much, uh, let's move our life onto the water rather than just, um, you know, go on holiday for a long time or something like that. But thankfully it has worked out. And I think some of the things that, that made that feasible, first and foremost, was starting to look at our team. We had been, I wouldn't say trapped, but I guess guilty of trying to do everything ourselves when we were running our business. Mm. Um, it was, okay, if I can do it myself, I will. I'll roll up my sleeves and get stuck in. If there's too much work for me, I'll just work twice as long. Um, and I realized that to build a business, actually, we need to look at the team that we've got around us, the systems and processes. And it was actually really nice to force ourselves to leave the UK and see if our business could continue to run. Because I think that had we not done that, I would still be doing everything myself. But actually yeah. stepping away from the day-to-day -day has allowed our business to grow much quicker and much better than I thought it would by bringing in people to do some of the stuff that I was doing. They can do it better than me. They can do it cheaper than yeah. me. Um, so I think actually, you know, the, the idea of removing yourself from your business is, is a challenge that I, I'd encourage everyone to do because it forces you to think, well, how can this run without me? And to me, that's what a business is. It's something that can continue to run without you being there doing everything yourself, going from that sort of entrepreneur mindset to business owner or CEO mindset. Mm. Um, it, it, it was probably the best decision that we had made because without that, like I say, I'd still be sitting in our house in Stockport doing everything myself, tapping away on my laptop 24 hours a day. Um, but we were forced to look at the people that we needed to get in the, you know, sort of bums on seats. And uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's actually been a, a blessing because the business took off when we left. <laughs> Brilliant. And, and that's, that's good advice to anybody who's thinking about, especially post COVID, you know, getting away from the same four walls all the time and, and actually having a bit of a change or go on a bit of an adventure. I think we all are looking for that next big adventure as well. Um, just two points I want to kind of drill down into. First one is you mentioned you have a team. Um, are they full-time employees? Are they like a support team, freelance, part-time? You know, how big's that in terms of the support that you kind of currently need? Uh, a real mix. So it started off with a virtual assistant in the Philippines um, yeah. and Jackie's still with us. Love her. Uh, such a good part of our team. But it was a nice way to start because it literally took us like, you know, $10 a week for, you know, she was working two hours a week for us, just doing yeah. a little bit on the podcast and stuff like that. And it was, um, yeah, a really nice way just to, understand if the help would be valuable if we had the time to manage somebody else um, and there was no commitment you know we didn't have to worry about setting up payroll we didn't have to think about you know hr or employment contracts or anything like that it was just a great way to um to sort of test the water so to speak she now works for us uh i think 20 hours a week so that's full time for her um, she wants to work 20 hours. She likes the flexibility of it. She can work from home. Um, so that is great. And we've got a couple of other virtual assistants now that have come on the back of that. Um, as well as Jackie, we have got, uh, two full-time members of staff in the UK that do like location specific roles. Obviously some of the property stuff, they need to be doing viewings and, yeah. uh, meeting builders on site and that sort of stuff. So we needed people physically on the ground. Um, and we took on, uh, a couple of people over the last few years to, to fill those roles. Um, and then we've got a couple of freelancers. So we've got a lady who does a lot of writing and content for our website based down in the south of England, doesn't need to be location um, specific. Um, but with the, the writing side of things, obviously writing good copy is, um, you know, it, it's something that we wanted somebody who had English as their first language, them being based in the UK, they understand the, the audience and the market they were going after. So we felt like whilst they didn't need to be physically next to us, it would be useful to have somebody in the UK, but the freelance model worked really well for that. Um, and then we've got a project manager who is pretty much full time, but mm. self-employed. So um, we sort of compensate him based on uh, the amount of work that he invoices effectively. So yeah, um, yeah he's self-employed, runs his own business, but it's kind of working pretty much for us. So it's a real mix and it's, it's nice. You know, I think a lot of people, when they, they look at hiring a team or getting help, they think, oh God, it needs to be 40 hours a week. Am I going to have to find a desk for them or an office? But you know, as much as we want to build that flexibility and that creativity into our lives as business owners, yep. I think so many people now, um, they like the consistency of having a job or an income from somebody else rather than starting their own business, but they want that flexibility, location, freedom, and all that stuff as well. So there are so many people looking for that flexibility. I think it's, it, there's so many options to get help on a, a part-time and informal and ad hoc basis. 
and I guess it's more of a gradual thing as well. You know, it's not like you just went on, uh, you know, six years ago, say you went, right, we're going to have to hire five people for different things. It's just been one of these things where the opportunities identified itself or, or, you, or the need to plug a gap has happened. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, that, that's, that's been the real beauty of it that, um, you know, we have been able to grow it fairly organically. The one thing I would say is with hindsight, I would have hired people quicker. I would have mm. tried to remove myself from the sort of day to day, um, you know, the sort of e-myth methodology of working on your business <laughs> rather than in it. I was very guilty. Yeah, I was yeah. there baking the cake, sweeping the floors. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think, like I said, when we moved to the boat, it was a real eye opener that actually there are more important things that I can focus on and getting other people to do some of the other stuff. They can do a better job of it than I can. So I wish we'd done it sooner, but yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's so nice that you can do it in that sort of organic fashion. Yeah, I guess that's it. It gives you more time as well for headspace, for strategy and actually thinking more about planning as well. Exactly. Final thing yeah. before we move on to our tips for other solo entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. Um, if someone was wanting to say become a digital nomad and you said obviously you kind of quit the UK, what's that kind of balance like between how long as a resident you would have to stay, you know, be in the UK for taxes or anything like that? You know, do you have to be six months and a day in the UK back or... Is there some kind of balance? Have you got to do any extra papers if you're floating around the Mediterranean or something on a nice boat? Yeah. So from a, a sort of um, a paperwork point of view, we are still UK residents, UK mm. taxpayers. Um, and that just made the whole thing easier. It's where our business is based. Uh, yeah. You know, we didn't want to think about setting up company in Malta or in the Cayman Islands or anything like that. So um, we are still UK residents, still UK taxpayers. We've got a home address here. Um, the, the biggest issue I suppose is more making sure that you don't overstay in places that we're traveling to. So, um, the boat is in Spain at the moment. Uh, mm. that's fine. But if we spend more than six months of the year in Spain, then by default, we have to become Spanish taxpayers. Yeah. Um, so there are, there are certain things like that, that we need to be mindful of, which is part of the reason that we like the idea of the boat, because we can move it around rather than say, okay, well, we're going to go and live in this place for three years. And then you need to think about residency and tax status. We go can... to France or Portugal or wherever's nearby, I guess, for a change of scene for a couple of months as well. Exactly. Yeah. So we can, we can juggle it around a little bit. Um, and obviously now with, with Brexit as well, um, we are no longer entitled to sort of unlimited free travel within the EU. So uh, I think we can only spend 90 days there out of every 180 days. Um, without again having to apply for a residency or anything like that so the flexibility of the boat being able to move around helps as well so yeah we 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 decided we made a conscious decision to keep our official status in the uk um yeah. and we're effectively just uh travelers in any of the places that we visit well based on that experience and how inspiring it sounds i think i'm going to be looking on some youtube videos about how to sail a boat or whatever you know well, we had no idea there. before we started so you can you can pick it up as you go <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like music to my ears. I think I might start with a dinghy or something in the back. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We'll take it from there. Okay, cool. So this is where we're moving through into the part of the show where you're able to give some of your own tips to other entrepreneurs out there who are thinking about doing something similar, maybe from your own business or maybe from experience or articles that you've read. So obviously you've built up a really loyal audience now, you know, social media, um, newsletters, your podcast. You know, what tips would you, you know, look to give to other entrepreneurs who are looking to start an audience from scratch? You know, we always ask this question because to start selling or to start obviously giving some kind of service, really need an audience to do this. So what kind of tips would you give to build one? So I think um, a lot of people struggle with patience when it comes to building an audience. For us, you know, the, the first hundred followers took us probably a year and then the second year, Maybe it got up to 500 and then, it, you know, it starts to snowball once you get traction, but you do, a lot of people get disheartened if they don't have you know, an immediate impact and go viral within a couple of months. So I think yeah. it's just slow and steady and consistent growth. And it's the people who are consistent over, you know, three, four, five years. It took us six years to get to where we are, but had we not started and stuck with it, obviously we never would have got here. So, um, I think a lot of people talk about these hacks to, you know, go viral or to gain thousands of followers overnight. But for us, what has worked well is just constantly showing up, 
trying to give our audience the type of value in the content that um, they want and just doing that on repeat day in, day out through different channels, trying to show up where they want to see it. Some of them want to see images on Instagram. Some of them want to have audio podcasts. Some of them prefer YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to hit those different, um, those different angles, but then just, like I say, just kind of showing up and providing value, good quality content on a regular basis. And then, you know, I, I don't really believe in shortcuts. It's just a case of, of doing yeah. that and, and waiting. And if you, if, if the content you're putting out there is good quality, um, it's high value, they, they will find you and they will come. Um, so that, that I'd say is the biggest thing, just consistency and patience. Um, but then equally, you know, you can tap into other people's audiences as well. There's, there's a big community out there in every industry of people who are creating content and looking for ideas, whether it's, you know, me coming and doing a podcast with Subkit or, you know, us getting other property investors on our podcast. They are yeah. piggybacking on our six years of, of growth. Um, and somebody who's new to the industry can come and get exposure to our audience because they're adding value to me by sharing their story on our podcast. So yeah. you can tap into other people's audiences and, and take advantage of people who have been doing it longer than you have. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, that the main thing, like I say, is, is that consistency and just uh, understanding going into it, that it'll probably take you longer than you think to grow an audience, which is not maybe what people want to hear, but it's <laughs> it's just kind of the, the, the reality of it. I'd rather be um, sort of truthful and say, yeah, you'll get there. It just take you time rather than uh, trying to give you some BS about, you know, overnight no, success. Look, we don't want too much BS. I mean, there's, there's plenty of opportunities on the show for me to talk BS, man, as well. But <laughs> it's just, I think there's many opportunities, I think, for people to have to share tips from a book. But, you know, one of our kind of, you know, mantras here with the Go Solo show is that we want it to be about people in the trenches who are actually doing this. You know, there's no point in us just interviewing somebody who's so far from reality. You know, they're worth billions or something, and yeah. they've you know literally have no idea how they operationally run their company. Yeah, you know, I imagine building your audience. You know, you've got the beauty of being six years into it is that you've pretty much got that growth equation sorted in terms of what you need to have happen on a weekly basis. You've managed to measure the met you know, the measure the data. You've been able to kind of work out what content works, like you said to the audience. But I imagine probably in those first 18 months, it's probably a lot of trial and error really working about what that marketing mix was to, you know, to get something that was, that was very streamlined and was obviously going to suit you for growth. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, it's still something that we are trying to figure out. Um, like the podcast, I think we got in, uh, and we, we followed the right sort of process for that. And we've had a, a, you know, a great response to the podcast that we created. Instagram works well for us. And I feel like the type of content that we're creating with the, the visual side of things, um, you know, they go hand in hand YouTube. On the other hand, I would love to have a bigger audience on YouTube, but mm. it's something that we still haven't really been able to, to figure out despite as putting out consistent content there, you know, there's a lot that goes into getting your thumbnail right and how you title them. And like, yeah. we're, we're, we're still trying to figure that piece out. So, um, you know, it, it is that trial and error. You, you, you try these different platforms and you'll probably find that you'll get a bit more traction in one versus another. You yeah. can either double down on that and just focus on your Instagram growth because that's going well. Um, but for us, we want to kind of try and be multi-channel, I guess. So we're, we're trying to figure out all the different pieces. Yeah, I guess probably not spreading yourself too thinly, but also not missing out on those opportunities. I guess something like property lends itself to Instagram very well because it's very uh, visual, yeah. you know, very inspiring. It's very, you know, you'll, you'll scroll and go, oh, look at this, I'll, I'll tag someone or whatever. Whereas for other people, depending on what their service-based business or businesses, it may not suit Instagram. So I guess it's kind of doing that research and having a think about what that, you know, the long-tail impact's going to be but also yeah. looking about whether it's relevant to your brand as well. Um, podcasts, I think I've name dropped uh, or number dropped this a few times now, 350 episodes. What advice would you give to somebody starting or looking to grow a podcast right now? So um, we, when we launched, went fairly general. And even at the time, um, I was like, oh God, is there a big enough audience here? But it turns out, you know, that the, there are plenty of people in interested in property investing in the UK, which is great. Um, but since then, we've seen a lot of successful podcasts in our same industry come in and do really well because they've sort of niched it down even further. So there are different strategies. You know, there's development, there's single lets, there's Airbnb. Yeah. And I think that um, that idea of not being afraid to get really specific with your, your message and the audience that you're trying to target 
is super important. Don't feel like you need to try and be all things to all people. If I was doing it again, I would probably be more specific and focus on one specific niche rather than property investing generally. Yeah. Um, and I think it, it, you know, it, it's this idea that you know, it's much better to have a fully engaged small audience who are perfect for the products or the services that you're looking to create rather yeah. than have this big audience who, you know, 60, 70, 80% of them are never going to buy what you're looking to sell because they're interested in kind of part of the industry, but not the part that you're passionate about creating a course on. So I think not being afraid to get really specific with the, the sort of subject that you're going after would be the first thing that I would suggest. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah. Um, sorry, okay. go on. No, 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 no I was on. just going to say the, um, you know, coming back to what I was saying about social media, that, that consistency side of things um, is, is something that, I, again, you know, just showing up for 350 episodes over the last six years has really helped ingrain us as one of the top uh, podcasts in our industry in the UK. But the only reason that we really got there was because we did what I just suggested in terms of piggybacking on other people's audience. So every guest that came on our show, it was a case of, well, can you share this with your audience? It's a great story. It puts you in the right light. Yep. And, um, you know, you, you don't need big names. If somebody has got, you know, 100 followers on Instagram, that's potentially 100 new listeners for your show. And it just it snowballed from there. So, um, you know, the, the, it, again, it's just I, I think it's a, it's a people game, right? It's about building relationships and, and adding value, giving them something that can be valuable for them. Um, and sort of that cross pollination and collaboration that's always worked out really well for us. Yeah, lots of peer-to-peer -peer and support as well. I think, you know, it helps bring everybody up, which is great, especially for relevance, you know, especially in terms of some of your guests, you know, I've looked over them, listened to a couple. It's important, I guess, that, you know, some of your audience is interested in their stuff, some of their audience is interested in your stuff. You might get new subscribers from both as well. Um, obviously, in terms of your own presenting style, obviously that's, you know, or, or, or I guess probably podcasting style, that's developed over time. Mm -hmm. You know, like how have you got better at your presenting and your research? Like how, how do you approach kind of getting better at the way that you run your podcasts? So I think it's something that you, you kind of need to feel your way in a little bit and just figure out as you go. When we first started out, I was, uh, God, I, I don't even go back and listen to them now, right? Because I'm just like <laughs> terrified of, of what I must have sounded like. Yeah. It was very wooden. I had like this very prescriptive list of questions. I think just having a conversation with people um, and letting them tell their story. There, there's, a, there's a great book by Donald Miller called Story Brand. Um, mm. So, uh, you know, the idea being that as a, a sort of business owner, as a service provider, um, you know, you don't want to pitch yourself as the hero of the story. You just want to be the guide. And I think that's the thing, kind of taking that step back and allowing your guests to, to shine. Mm. Um, so knowing what their biggest successes are and, and doing some research into, you know, what their background story is and, and really giving them a platform and a spotlight to, to present themselves in the best light rather than making it all about yourself and your own successes. Yeah. Um, it does well for them, but then equally it allows you to almost elevate yourself from, okay, this is the Mike Stenhouse show to actually, you know, we've helped these people do these things. And uh, then it positions you as the, the guide, the educator, the teacher, which then when it comes to, well, who am I going to learn from? Yeah. Um, you know, it kind of directs people back to you being at the front of their mind. So I think, you know, just, uh, you, you need to, you need to, um, give people that opportunity rather than sort of, like I say, making it about you, uh, you know, really yeah. use your guests to, to share their value and knowledge, which helps your audience uh, understand yeah. the issues better. Um, but yeah, it's, it's something that we're still, you know, trying to, trying to improve upon, tweaking the questions, refining the format and playing around with the length of the show. Um, there's a yeah. lot of different variables that come into it. And, you know, as you said earlier about testing everything, um, you know, it's something we get to have some fun with trying new things, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't yeah. mistakes will pass pretty quickly, right? You know, you yeah. do a, you do an episode that you think is going to be a winner and it doesn't take off fine. You know, it's, it's, it's there, it's in the background and you can move on to the next show the next week. Well, that's good advice. I mean, I always try and live my life as well by this kind of whole thing of Kai's and it's that Japanese saying of like continuous mm -hmm. improvement. Yeah. It's like, can we make small tweaks? I guess you don't want to completely destroy the format of your show week to week that your audience like what the hell's going on now exactly you make yeah. these tweaks it's easier to roll them back i guess if something you feel it's worked if it hasn't whereas if you go too far down the rabbit hole it's difficult to kind of you know like uh, keep that consistency as well 
Yeah, and we actually, uh, we made that mistake a couple of years back now where uh, me being, um, I guess, impulsive, I was lying in bed one night and thought, oh God, we need to change everything. You know, this is broken. <laughs> we, 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 we're going to totally transform it and it's going to be a million times better. And, uh, you know, you make that big bang announcement, everything's changing, everything's <laughs> going to be different, better. And you get, you know, like half your audience get in touch with you and say, well, what the heck, Mike, that's not what I signed up for. And you get that yeah. feedback quickly, which is a good thing about having an engaged audience. They'll tell you if you've gone wrong. So yeah. we quickly rolled it back. But we realized on the back of that, that it does need to be more gradual. You can change things. Yeah. Um, but it's a good way to engage your audience as well. Ask them what they want to see on the show. Ask them the type of guests that they would like to have on, if they could recommend anyone, or the questions that you would like uh, you, they would like to, to ask. And it works. You know, it helps you create better content. But then it also makes them feel much more engaged in the process if they feel like they're shaping the content or the you know the courses, the education that you're putting out there because they've had some input in it. New Coke versus old Coke. It's just like, you know, it's a like complete rebrand there to bring the old back. But I guess, you know, it kind of almost opens up two, uh, two marketing things for the Coca-Cola company. Yeah, exactly. Um, final question before we move on to a rapid fire round. It's a bit of a short thing as well. We always tack this in there because I think it is so important in terms of entrepreneurs. You know, what do you do for work-life balance? What, 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 what kind of stuff do you do to kind of keep it all together on a daily basis? So I'm definitely not the best at this. Um, you know, I am. I am <laughs> not one. Honesty is appreciated. Well, I, I don't have a morning routine. Um, you know, I uh, there there are things that I think I should do, but you know, the reality is that as a, a sort of a, you know a business owner, a, an entrepreneur, whatever term you want to use, the reality is that the hours are long. And uh, you know you need to put in that that sort of grind to to get to the the success that you're shooting for. I'm trying to get better at it, and obviously having a, a partner uh, who keeps me grounded helps. And she'll tell me, "Shut the laptop. You've been sat in that same chair in your pants for the last three days. It's time you like stretch the legs." Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, there's there's a couple of things. I think exercise. I definitely when I exercise, so I I, I enjoy running, and I do notice a massive difference um, in my thinking and you know the, the clarity that I can get on my productivity as well and it's you know the ironic thing is I say I don't have time to go out for a run for 30 minutes but yeah. if I make that time I'm then twice as effective for the day yeah um, so I do think that you know exercise and diet basic ones like I say I don't have a fancy morning routine where I'm waking up and meditating and you know not checking my phone for you know the first two hours that I'm awake or anything like that I get up I grab my laptop or my phone and I start working um, but when I find time for exercise, I find time to eat well, it has a massive impact on me. But the beauty of, I think, running your own business and, you know, the, the life that we have created, um, with the boat and everything else that's going on, I work because I enjoy it, but equally I've, I've got the time when I feel drained, I'm on the verge of burnout. Um, or you know what, I just wake up and I'm like, nah, I don't really fancy it today. I can, I, I can take those days off. So if I'm, if I'm in a good place if i've got the energy i'll i'll work 12 14 16 hour days because i enjoy it but then equally um you know if we've got something else that we want to do in our personal lives or I, i'm not in the mood for work it's, it's nice to have that flexibility to take it off so you're more of that kind of like macro balance it's more like the um you know maybe not daily things you'll put in place to keep it together but actually on the kind of grand scheme of things you would actually be more like i'll put the in really intense four solid days or something but then you might have an extended weekend or like you said yeah exactly something, you can do that yeah, yeah yeah i mean look i don't I think there's there's people have all got different answers for that kind of question some people meditate some people don't some yeah. people exercise i think exercise is such a big thing you know making sure there's that time for the exercise like you said there's endorphin release the actual clarity that comes from it you know, having some time out away from it, I think is so important. Whether that's running, tennis, anything else, I think it's just important to have that time away from the computer, away from your phone, away from conversations, away from everything else on a daily basis as well. Yeah, for sure. I think like everyone is is unique and that, that idea that, oh, you know, I, I read the, you know, Miracle Morning, Hal Elrod, oh, you know, I need to meditate. And you kind of try to force yourself. And I went through this, right? I was like, okay, I don't really get meditation, but I, I need to meditate because everybody says you should meditate. And not everything is right for every person. You need to find out what works for you. Um, one yeah. thing that I did, I do pay attention to is my sort of energy levels throughout the day. Like I have a definite um, 
peak in the morning and a peak in the evening. So mm -hmm. any creative work, any strategic stuff I, I do then. Uh, and then in the afternoon, when I know that I'm going to have lower energy, I will either have stuff scheduled in that's maybe less important, just admin tasks or whatever else, or I'll just, I know that the afternoon is when I'll take the dogs for a walk, I'll go for a run, I'll go and do site visits of the project because that kind of yeah. re-energizes me. So be, just being yeah. aware of like how your own cycle works is, is definitely useful. Oh, that's really good advice. I think just like you said, being aware of how you work, how your brain body functions, you know, we all need to tap into what works best for us and yeah. probably double down on that as well. Right, we're moving on to our rapid fire round now, Mike, you'd be pleased to know. Uh, I'm going to throw a load of questions at you. Feel free okay. to give a little bit of flavour to each of them, obviously, if you want to. Uh, but we'll rattle through these. We're, we're building out a uh, you know a mini libraries of some of these questions as well, so as we can take the top tips from the solopreneurs, entrepreneurs that we have on the show. So who are your favorite entrepreneurs and why? So, I mean, I guess the, the obvious answer is you look at guys like Elon Musk and just everything they touch turn into gold is, is phenomenal. But for me, actually, there's, there's a couple of maybe less well-known examples. Um, so uh, there's a guy called Danny Mayer, who's this New York restaurateur. Um, he's written a great book called Setting the Table about, you know, always trying to over, go over and above, over deliver on the, the service that you provide to your customers. And he's built this, this great business in New York. He's probably got a dozen restaurants now. Uh, he was the founder of Shake Shack as well. Yeah. No um, so, um, yeah, I think Danny Mayer just, he, he really sort of gets that balance, right? I think between passion and customer service, doing what you love. I think that's so important, you know, doing, doing mm -hmm. things that you, you really love. Um, and another guy I've got a lot of time for is Tony Shea, the founder of Zappos. Yep. So, um, you know, obviously bought it by Amazon now, but you read his startup story. And again, it was that focus on customer service um, and just really trying to over deliver. And, uh, you know, that, you know, we, we talk about marketing and what we can do to sort of like hack growth on social media and stuff. But actually getting your customers to talk about you and to share their stories is one of the best things that we can do. And I think, you know, Tony, with the um, sort of free delivery and returns on shoes, which was something that hadn't been seen before, such a simple yeah. idea. Um, but, you know, their, their customer service reps not measured on how quickly can you get people off the phone. But let's have the conversation with them, even if it takes two hours to get them to pick the right pair of shoes. Yeah, that's what it takes. And that sort of stuff, I think they both have similar sort of philosophies that I really like. Brilliant. Let's pull that down into the kind of you know, amazing customer service heading. But yeah, both of those are going in. They haven't been recommended. So they're both brand new entries into our into our library as well. Good. Um, who's your most inspiring person in life? Oh, good question. Um, so there, there's a couple of things running through my head just now. Um, I think, you know, from a, in terms of running a business, and this is going to sound so cheesy, and I know Victoria is going to be like raising her eyebrows at me in the background, <laughs> oh, but, US, but I, I, I know for a fact I wouldn't be where I was if it wasn't growing up under my parents' roof, watching them um, run businesses, struggle, you know, mm -hmm. do well at times, but struggle at times, uh, keep the relationship together. Um, raised three kids and uh, you know you saw the sacrifices that they made for them so if I can give a shout out to my parents I think that's uh, you know a good place to start and for anyone who is raising a family running a business um, for Victoria and I just know it's us and our two dogs we don't have that family thing that we need to worry about so I kind of yeah. feel you know we're we're, um, we're kind of fortunate in that regard that we've been able to build the business without having I mean trying to juggle family life as well must be a real struggle so any anyone who is growing a business and running a family I think deserves a shout out for sure yeah um, but then I guess from like a, a pure um, a sort of a, a business point of view I think you know one of the um, one of the guys who really got me set up on this digital nomad side of things was Tim Ferriss you know yeah big name for our work week um i don't think we will ever get to four hour work week but some of the principles <laughs> that he talks about yeah. um you know he was the one that first got us thinking about building a team um you know having uh, he's got multiple different streams of income in terms of a, a model for growth i think you know there there are a few people that have done it as well as he has yeah i agree i think ferris has actually come up uh, and, and again i've been an avid reader all the books are on the shelf uh, you know, for many, I think pretty much everybody's actually name-checked Tim Ferriss. I think it's that kind of, 
I think it was a very accessible business book when you brought out the four yeah. hour work week. It actually made you reassess what you wanted out of life. And although, like you said, we're never ever going to be dreaming of the four hour work week. I'll be lucky if I can cram everything into about 50 or 60 hours at the moment. But there is at least that something in the head saying, right, what are we actually working for? You know, are we looking to just retire at age or are we going to have these mini holidays or it's got to be something more to it and that enjoyment as well out of life. So yeah, yeah. Tim Ferriss has come in very well. Maybe we should start getting an affiliate off him or something like that. If, <laughs> if everybody starts seeing it here. Um, you kind of covered this already, but you know, any other favorite business books or online resources you'd throw in there for, you know, solopreneurs, entrepreneurs who want to, you know, start, run or grow a business? Yeah. Can I give a couple? Give a couple. Let's, let's keep it to two. Otherwise our library might, you know, we might need to uh, yeah, get, get some storage. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I tell you what then I will. Um, so there, there's a guy who I am just getting into just now, but I think I, you know, going back to building a team and putting those systems in place. Something I'm really passionate about getting to is running a business rather than being a, an entrepreneur. Um, and there's a guy called Gino Wickman who's got a book called Traction, which I think is a, a must read for anyone who, and I think that it's never too early to start thinking about your business as a business rather than just, okay, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm doing everything myself. You need, mm. you know, we, we need to think from day one is, is how can we, um, how can we create a business? So that book traction is, is a good one. Yeah, um, sure. but the other guy that I, I couldn't not name check, obviously, uh, Gary V, I I think crush it was probably one of the first like social media type books that, yeah. um, I came across a lot of his content is crazy. Um, you know, I, I I'm not a big fan of his like daily vlogs or anything it's like that, but I think that, the principles so. that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the principles that he shares from a, a social media and a branding point of view are pretty on point. So, mm. um, yeah, definitely worth paying attention to, Plus, to his philosophy, if not necessarily his content. Yeah. And also I guess he's very unique as well in terms of he is the brand as well. I think, you know, we talk about different kind of ways we're going to get cut through to our audience, but I guess with him, whatever that kind of hustle, hard mentality, shouting at the camera, you know, at least it kind of gets your attention, whether it's for you or not, in terms of like whether you fully subscribe into that. Like you said, there's quite a lot of learnings from the stuff he's put out there as well in the past. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you could do things differently, what would you do, you know, what would you do differently again? I feel like I'm just repeating myself. So tell me if you want a different answer, Johnny, but um, the, the single most important thing I think I could have done differently would be to, uh, I guess, get out of my own way and, and start building a team sooner. I think, you know, we, we kind of need to think about running our business as a business and think about the structure that we want in place with us at the top, what are the different functions within the business and yeah. ultimately who are the different people that, that we want in there. And start getting help to, to run those areas that aren't within your zone of genius so much earlier. I think we often get trapped thinking, oh, well, you know, I can't afford to get help in or I don't have time to do it. But it is the most liberating thing. And it's the, the single biggest driver for growth in our business was, was getting help in and thinking of it as a business with core functions. You know, there's a, a sales and marketing function. There's a, a development function. There's operations like once we started looking at our business wrap that way rather than just oh we've got like a million things to do what are we going to do today and just like sort of constant panic firefighting mode yeah. um that's when things really started to change for us so i just i just wish we had done it sooner no i don't even mind you doubling down triple down if you need to because i think you know we we have to get the message across to people as well you know like this is what people want is to is to be reminded of this um if time was of no significance, you know, what would be the number one thing you think you could do over and over again to grow your business? So say you just had one thing that you were allowed to do to grow your business, what do you think would be the most important? I I think it would be um, I think it would be a focus on the so I'll, I'll sort of drill it down here. I think it would be a focus on building that audience. Um, and I think for us, that audience would be Instagram specifically. So I, I, I think it would just be even more time sharing content, sharing value, um, and just kind of trying to help people for free, because I think that leads to more growth. The, the free content leads to paid content. Um, and you know, I think the best way to sell is to give stuff away for free. First of all, let people understand if you're the type of person that you want to work with, if, um, the, you know, the way that you teach, the way you talk about things, your values, your philosophies resonate with them. The best way to do that isn't through, 
you know, a sort of 3,000 word sales page or a, you know, a video sales letter, or what, you know, whatever you might use as your, um, your sort of uh, your landing page or your offer, but actually just, you know, having conversations with people on social media, sharing your values with them, it would just be Instagram, 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 building the yeah. audience. And then I think after, you know, once you've got that audience, everything else will take care of itself. So a lot of top of funnel work, just kind of working there, knowing that obviously the results will come later on down the line. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think a lot of people look at, um, you know, what do I want to sell? And then they'll go out and they'll try to build the audience. But I think if you build the audience first, they will tell you what they want to buy. And then you've already got people, you, your, your customers are there. They're hungry for it because you've created exactly what they want. Brilliant. And um, this is a change of pace here, Mike. But please tell us a funny anecdote about something that's happened to you in business. Uh, I hope something comes to mind. But has there been anything which has been extremely amusing or something funny which has just been completely out of the blue and crazy in your entrepreneurial journey? Uh, funny story. Um, I am trying to think. I'm, I'm, this is a good question. There's got to be something, Johnny. Give me, give me um, what sort of stuff have other people shared with you? Well, we've had, what have we had? We've had someone who runs a, a really amazing Indian supper club. She had people turning up at her house the wrong night. Oh, no uh, way. For the thing, and she was there like in her pajamas. We've had uh, Martin, a, a tech correspondent who was running a panel, was put on the wrong panel and found out that none of his guests knew the subject. And yeah. He had to kind of bluff and blag his way through that. Fine, I, I, um, I, I, because what came to mind, I was like, this, this isn't funny, but you know, it's, it's in a similar vein to those stories, and I guess it, it, it kind of shows you that that life goes on. You know, the idea that mistakes are short lived and you'll quickly pass them. I spent an entire week recording. This was probably in year one of the podcast. We were doing three episodes a week at this time, so it was, yeah. we were churning out the content, and it was a real focus for us. And I spent an entire week with the wrong settings and didn't record a single episode. I think there were probably 10 interviews that we did that just weren't there. I, I got to the end of the week, went to edit them, and I was like, ah, oh, geez, where have these gone? So not funny in the, the sort of like ha-ha-ha sense, but you know, looking back on it, it was one of those things that I just, at the time, I was like, oh my God, my life is over. These 10 people have spent <laughs> their time with, you know, they were... Um, they, they, they'd taken time out of their day and, you know, I told them that these episodes were going to get out to this big audience and then, you know, I had to go back with my tail between my legs and say, can we, can, can we do it again, do please? It. Actually, some of those episodes turned out to be the best ones that we did because that second take, you know, it was a bit more refined yeah, and yeah. they kind of were on point with what they were talking about. But it, it, it was one of those things, like I say, at the time where I just thought life was over. It was such a drama. Um, but actually, you know, None of them cared. They all understood it. We all make mistakes in our business. Yeah. Um, so yeah, not not funny for me, but um, you know, just funny how funny how these things that you think are going to devastate you actually, you know, four or five years down the line, yeah, it didn't exactly. have a yeah. There was there was no impact. So mistakes happen, um, and you know, I guess it's more about how you deal with them. I mean, I, I guess if you're not making mistakes, you're not experimenting enough, you know, and and that was more of a. Like maybe it was new software. Maybe, yeah, don't you know, experiment whatever, with your Skype settings, I think, is exactly, the moral of that story. Exactly, yeah, yeah. But I think, yeah, that's, that's definitely... But like you said at this time, I imagine it was very devastating. But then, you know, to, to get back on the horse, on the grand scheme of things, you definitely don't, won't do it again. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's exactly. Sure. Yeah, well, exactly. You know, it kind of teaches you what not to do. Exactly. Um, as an entrepreneur, what ultimately does success mean to you? So whenever we are starting out with, um, most of our education starts with uh, a focus on goal setting. So helping people figure out where they want to get. And we kind of break um, success down into three different buckets. So a lot of people think it starts and ends with financial freedom. That's important to everyone to an extent. We all want to be able to keep a roof over our heads and food on the table. For us, you know, for, for some people, that's where it ends. You know, money isn't important to them beyond that. Other people want Lamborghinis in the driveway and private jets and that sort of stuff. But financial freedom is a big one. But then beyond that, we look at location freedom. So, yeah. you know, being able to work on your own terms where you want. For us, it's on a boat. Some people want to be able to travel for six months of the year or, you know, location freedom is important to some people, not everyone. And then the third one is time freedom. The mm -hmm. idea that um, you know, if you want to drop off early to pick the kids up from school or you want to take Fridays off to play golf or work two hour work weeks or, you know, whatever it might be. But yeah. 
those those three sort of buckets financial freedom time freedom and location freedom are are what um we think most goals tend to break down to but I think that's the thing as as an entrepreneur it's kind of creating the life that that you want on your terms rather than thinking that you need to be making a million pounds a year to be successful or you know some other sort of arbitrary metric that you've probably taken from somebody else's goals and aspirations it's about building that lifestyle that gives you the freedom whether it's time money or location to do what you want with who you want Um, and i think that you know ultimately if your aspirations are to you want to you want to take your kids to and from school every day and, and spend time with them then a business that makes you enough money that you can do that but you don't need to be working 12 16 hours a day and miss their childhood i think that is success yeah. so i think it'll be different for every person um but it's got to start with you know why are you doing this in the first place a lot of us it's to leave a job behind you know a corporate gig um or do something like to to leave behind something that we're not passionate about but we often get consumed by this drive for creating more and more money. Um, yeah. And actually, we only need so much of that. And then it becomes about more important things, um, the, yeah. the, the time and the location. So, um, yeah, for, for us, it was location. I enjoy working. I don't want to retire. But yeah. being able to work from the boat, that was what was important to me. Um, rather than saying, well, you know what, we want to build a multi-million pound portfolio and the only way to do that is to to go and stop we, we've definitely sacrificed growth from a financial point of view to go and live on the boat but i'm, I'm delighted with that so yeah um yeah i guess that's kind of what it looks like to us oh and that's great i appreciate again the extra kind of depth in terms of going into that because you know freedom is a hot topic you know i think you know about half of these podcasts we recorded so far people are saying freedom mm. i'm running other kind of content pieces on our go solo blog and freedom is something coming back. So what does freedom mean? I think you've just kind of summed that up really, really well, but you're right. There's no point in earning a million a year if you're massively miserable and it's just not going somewhere. Can you build a sustainable business? Can you make it work in your life? Can you be developing monthly recurring revenue? Can you be getting to a point where for you, success is reaching that kind of goal and and kind of keeping it together as well in all parts of your life? Yeah. For those people out there who are maybe sat on the fence, a bit nervous, maybe people who are thinking about going solo, starting their own business, what advice would you give to them? Uh, I think, you know, again, we've kind of touched on it, but the idea of testing ideas is so important. I don't think you need to make this grand commitment to, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to leave my job and this is my, my new future. Like, um, you know, we started the podcast whilst we still had other things going on. Victoria was still in the corporate world. We transitioned into um, the business in a gradual way. So I left and then Victoria followed me. I think you can test lots of things. You know, there, there are lots of hours in the day where you're not committed to your core job that you can you can try these things. And it's, yeah. it's you know, spend two, three hours a night for the next six months, seeing if it works, seeing if you're passionate about it. Um, I, I would encourage everyone to, to try and, and follow their passion. And I think it's only by trying that you will then get the feedback you need to know if you need to adjust, pivot, uh, maybe try something different. Mm-hmm. But unless you give it a shot in the first instance, you'll never know. There are so many people that are on the fence, like you say, um, but they're almost kind of scared to jump in. The, the, the cost of entry to setting up an Instagram account, launching a podcast, it's, it's minuscule. You know, it doesn't yeah. take much. It's just that effort. Um, and if you can't carve out a couple of hours now, then, you know, it's, it, it, I, I think everyone has got some free time in their schedule where they're sitting watching Netflix or, you know, they're not being super productive. Um, yeah. I think it's, it's definitely possible for everyone to try. But, you know, that, that idea of just giving it a go um, the answers will become much clearer once you do get started. We didn't know what our monetization looked like with the podcast until we were about six months into it. Um, yeah. But we just thought, you know, let's let's give it a shot and, and see where it goes. And it, it sort of came from there. So, yeah, I think just getting started, but not being afraid to, to get it wrong and then have to pivot. That's great advice, Mike. Yeah, you're right. You know, even no matter what starting looks like, whether it's a couple of hours a day, a couple of hours a week, whatever, if you don't start, then you're never really going to test it out. It's just going to be a potential idea or a hypothesis. Final question: You'd be pleased to know. Uh, what's your overall vision for the next few years? Yeah, well, what's your kind of dream outcome? So um, we have some specific goals that we are looking to achieve from a financial point of view. 
um, and they are tied back to, um, I guess, sort of more like vision board type stuff. We, th yeah, th there, there are there are certain uh, areas that that we want to not areas. I suppose there are certain um, things that we covet. I guess you know we uh, at some point we'll be looking at a family, and that means probably life back on land. So you know, yeah. it's thinking about well, what does the house look like, and what do we, what position do we need to be in to afford that and that sort of stuff. So there's some financial stuff, but in terms of the actual business, um, it's kind of more of the same for the next three to five years. It's continuing to grow the, the property portfolio. I think there's huge potential with the podcast and the media side of things to grow that. But fundamentally, it all comes back to, um, you know, the reason I'm talking a lot about running your business as a business rather than just this sort of busy entrepreneurs, because that's what I'm really focusing on just now, trying to get the team in place. Yeah. trying to get the right people in the right seats doing the right things um so this year for us is really about that business um structure the you know what does the team need to look like what are the different functions of our business and who can best fulfill them so that next year and beyond the the business can really continue to grow but without me being as involved in it on a day-to-day -day basis so mm -hmm. It's kind of taken us six years to get to this stage where I'm starting very slowly to feel more like a business owner than uh, an entrepreneur, if you like. Yeah. Um, but it's just sort of doubling down on that and, and really trying to create something that is scalable and sustainable without me having to continue to work the 12, 16 hour days. Um, yeah. And I'll find something else to fill my time. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I don't I don't want to do that so that yeah. um, so that I can I can then ease off. I'll go and open the, the barbecue restaurant or something. But you know, I think it's a sort of natural transition. Any new business is going to take your, your full-time commitment more than your full-time commitment for the first couple of years. But I think we need to, you know, for a business to genuinely be successful, um, it needs to be profitable with staff. It needs to be sustainable mm -hmm. without you working on it day to day. So I think that's the sort of, um, the I guess it's a sort of personal achievement that I'm looking for to say that actually I've built a business that can, be you know continue to run without me rather than just uh you know a job that i've created for myself amazing no it's all really great advice as well and you know there's lots of empty units in, in heat and more still so if you do have a <laughs> barbecue joint idea please do uh you know set it up about five minutes walk from my house yeah we will cool. keep you posted i appreciate that mike it's been great to have you on the show today uh really enjoyed chatting with you about your own entrepreneurial journey um can you remind everybody where they can get in touch with you you know your website social media where do you want to point people towards uh, yeah, best place. Um, so everything is inside property investing. Um, so social media, Instagram is probably the best place to go. Um, if you search for inside property investing, you'll find our website. But yeah, Instagram's where we hang out the most. It's probably the best place to get in touch and engage with us, but equally see see what we're up to from a, a property point of view, uh, see the type of projects that we're working on. It's It's the best route into our world, if you like. Amazing. Well, I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for coming on the show. Uh, Mike from Inside Property Investing, thanks for joining us today on the Go Solo Show and good luck for the rest of your business. Cheers. Thanks for having me, Johnny. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you.